today. Uh, so we'll start today with our uh, um, daily uh, press conference with people that you already know and that you've been following for some time. Uh, and of course, uh, Dr. Teresa Tam will be there for, uh, we'll be talking about the daily update. Uh, and of course, uh, the uh, the Deputy Chief Health uh, Administrator also, Dr. New, will also be there to provide some remarks. Donc, euh, Teresa Tam et Dr. Nou vont être, euh, nous vont être là pour euh, vraiment répondre, mettre, euh, donner une mise à jour et en, en, ensuite répondre, bien entendu, à des questions. Et euh, mon collègue Mark Miller et moi serons là également pour euh, d'autres annonces. Et euh, nous serons là pour euh, euh, parler de, de sujet, du sujet du jour. Euh, Jérémy euh, sera là pour animer la conférence. Alors, commençons. Après vous. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Bonjour. There are now 97,125 confirmed cases of COVID-19, including 7,960 deaths and 56,639, or 58% of cases have now recovered. Labs across Canada have tested over 1,989,000 people for COVID-19 to date. Over the past week, we have been testing an average of 33,000 people daily, with 2% of these testing positive. These numbers change quickly and are now being updated once daily in the evenings on canada.ca slash coronavirus. After months of Canadians working together to flatten the curve and protect our health system, province and territories have been able to resume some important medical procedures like elective surgeries. So for parents, children and adults of all ages who have been anxiously waiting out the weeks and months of COVID-19, not being able to schedule surgeries for a whole range of medical issues has only added to their pain and discomfort. Resuming these important medical procedures has been a top priority of reopening plans, but there is another challenge to address. Earlier, I talked about the ongoing needs to continue donating blood. I ask blood donors to book and keep their appointments to help prevent shortages and Canadians rose to the call. It is thanks to Canadians continuing to donate throughout the COVID-19 crisis that Canadian Blood Services and IMA Quebec have been able to keep up with demand for medical emergencies. However, as elective procedures have now resumed, there is a growing need for blood donations to restore and maintain critical inventory. So I am asking Canadians once again to roll up their sleeves and help out. Canadian Blood Services and AMA Quebec have enhanced measures in place, including robust cleaning, infection control and screening practices to protect all donors, staff and volunteers. Physical distancing measures are in place at all blood donor clinics, including by appointment only visits to limit the number of people within clinics and spacing or screener of donor, of donor beds. Wearing of masks is mandatory for all staff and volunteers and all donors are pre-screened when they book their appointments and screened again on arrival. This week, from June 8th to the 14th, is National Blood Donor Week, when we recognize the essential role that donors play in strengthening Canada's lifeline. So it's a great week to schedule an appointment for your regular donation or sign up as a new donor to join the lifeline. Thank you. Merci. Bonjour. On compte maintenant 97 125 cas confirmés de COVID-19, dont 7 960 décès et 56 639 cas ou 58 des cas maintenant rétablis. À ce jour, des laboratoires de partout au Canada ont analysé des tests de dépistage de la COVID-19 de plus de 1 989 000 personnes. Au cours de la dernière semaine, nous avons testé en moyenne 33 000 personnes par jour, dont 2 ont obtenu un résultat positif. Ces chiffres changent rapidement et sont maintenant mis à jour une fois par jour le soir sur canada.ca baroblique le traduction coronavirus. Après des mois de collaboration entre les Canadiens pour aplatir la courbe et protéger notre système de santé, les provinces et les territoires ont pu reprendre d'importantes procédures médicales comme les chirurgies électives. Donc, pour les parents, les enfants et les adultes de tous âges qui ont attendu anxieusement que passent les semaines et les mois de la pandémie de COVID-19, 
le fait de ne pas pouvoir planifier une intervention chirurgicale pour toute une gamme de problèmes médicaux n'a fait qu'ajouter à leur douleur et à leur inconfort. La reprise de ces procédures médicales importantes a été une priorité absolue des plans de réouverture, mais il y a un autre défi à relever. Plus tôt cette année, on a parlé de la nécessité de continuer à donner du sang. On a demandé aux donneurs de sang de prendre des rendez-vous et de les respecter pour aider à prévenir les pénuries et les Canadiens ont répondu à l'appel. C'est grâce aux dons continus des Canadiens tout au long de la crise de la COVID-19 que la Société canadienne de sang et Emma Québec ont pu répondre à la demande pour les urgences médicales. Toutefois, à mesure que les interventions électives reprennent, il devient de plus en plus nécessaire de faire des dons de sang pour rétablir et maintenir les stocks essentiels. On demande donc encore une fois aux Canadiens de se retrousser les manches et d'aider. La Société canadienne du sang et Emma Québec ont mis en place des mesures améliorées, notamment des solides pratiques de nettoyage, de contrôle des infections et des dépistages pour protéger tous les donneurs, le personnel et les bénévoles. Des mesures de distanciation physique sont en place dans tous les centres de dons de sang, y compris des visites uniquement sur rendez-vous pour limiter de long, le nombre de personnes dans les centres, dans les centres et l'espacement des lits de donneurs ou la mise en place de paravents entre ces derniers. Le port d'un masque est obligatoire pour tout le personnel et tous les bénévoles et tous les donneurs font l'objet d'un contrôle préalable lorsqu'ils prennent leur rendez-vous et sont soumis à un nouveau contrôle à leur arrivée. Cette semaine, du 8 au 14 juin, marque le, la semaine nationale du don de sang et nous reconnaissons le rôle essentiel que jouent les donneurs dans le renforcement de la chaîne de la vie du Canada. C'est donc une excellente semaine pour fixer un rendez-vous pour votre don régulier ou pour vous inscrire en tant que nouveau donneur afin de vous joindre en ligne de vie. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Euh, donc, passons maintenant la parole à mon estimé collègue, Mark Miller. Après toi, Mark. Merci, Mélanie. I first would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of Algonquin people. Kwe, Tanse, Sego, Ulukut, good afternoon, bonjour. We continue to see the COVID-19 curve flattening on First Nations reserves and in Nunavik. As of June 10th, there have been 237 confirmed cases of COVID-19 on First Nations reserves in provinces and 16 cases in Nunavik. The total of recovered cases stands at 207 for First Nations reserves and 16 in Nunavik. While these are positive developments, individuals need to remain vigilant in their personal measures to protect themselves, their families and communities. In particular, as we see the gradual reopening of businesses, activities and travel across the country, the risk of a resurgence of new infections is something we simply can't ignore. We're very mindful of this and we'll continue to work with Indigenous communities and partners as they respond to the health and social impacts of COVID-19. While our top priority remains the health and safety of individuals, I want to acknowledge the tough times Indigenous businesses and economies have faced as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. There are more than 30,000 Indigenous businesses in Canada. These are places of pride, of strength, of growth for many communities. Most of these businesses are small to medium-sized enterprises and operated in sectors particularly hard hit by COVID-19. Due to their small size, they operate with low liquidity and face unique challenges in accessing private credit. We've announced both targeted and broad-based benefits to support businesses across this country in the hope that they can still have a business to reopen when the time comes. In response to the specific needs of Indigenous businesses on April 18th, we announced $306.8 million in funding to small and medium-sized businesses that work within the network of Aboriginal financial institutions across Canada. This funding is providing interest-free loans and non-repayable contributions to small and medium-sized Indigenous businesses to address the immediate financial impacts of the pandemic. But we recognize that there are still gaps that need to be addressed to ensure that no Indigenous business, First Nation, Inuit or Métis, slips through the cracks. And that's why today I'm pleased to announce an additional $133 million in new support for Indigenous businesses. This new funding includes $16 million to support the Indigenous tourism industry through the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada. 
This will help sustain and stabilize approximately 640 indigenous tour- tourism businesses by providing non repayable grants of up to $25,000. As we transition into the summer months, the tourism sector will continue to feel the impact of this pandemic. It's particularly hard hit. And we want to support all that they do to show off some of the best that this country has to offer. Ce nouveau financement comprend 16 millions de dollars pour soutenir l'industrie touristique autochtone par le biais de l'Association touristique autochtone du Canada. Ce financement contribuera à soutenir et à stabiliser environ 640 entreprises touristiques autochtones en offrant des subventions non remboursables pouvant atteindre 25 000 Alors que nous débutons la saison estivale, le secteur du tourisme continuera de ressentir l'impact de cette pandémie. Nous voulons nous assurer de soutenir ce secteur essentiel afin que les organisations autochtones de partout au Canada puissent offrir une variété d'activités qui mettront en valeur leur patrimoine, leur culture et leur milieu de vie. This targeted funding will help Indigenous tourism businesses weather COVID-19 by supporting businesses as they seek out new ways of operating in a changed world. The Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada is already doing vital work to support the Indigenous tourism sector through these difficult times. This funding is expected to roll out in the coming weeks so that they can ramp up their work and support more Indigenous tourism operators from coast to coast to coast. We are also allocating $117 million to support Indigenous businesses with persisting needs and who may not be eligible for existing business support measures. We know that, just like in all communities across Canada, Indigenous businesses are vital. They are vital to the economic health and development of communities, they are vital to the industrial sectors in which they operate, and they will play a a vital role in Canada's recovery from this crisis. We want to make sure that they are still there on the other side of this pandemic. This funding will seek to meet needs. For example, communities could use this funding to assist micro-entrepreneurs, including home-based businesses and essential economic activities such as hunters and artisans who are ineligible for mainstream measures. Funding could be used for various activities such as community economic development services, capacity building, planning, and retrofitting of businesses for reopening. More information on the rollout of these measures will be available in due course. We will also continue to engage with other government departments, provincial and territorial governments, as well as Indigenous leadership, to ensure that we fill gaps, meet ongoing needs, and hopefully position all sectors of this economy so that they are able to make a full recovery. Le soutien des peuples autochtones au Canada est une responsabilité partagée entre le gouvernement fédéral, les gouvernements provinciaux et territoriaux et les partenaires autochtones. Faire progresser la réconciliation signifie changer les lois, les politiques et les pra- pratiques coloniales et s'attaquer à leurs impacts sur la vie des peuples autochtones. Je m'engage à bâtir une renation renouvelée, fondée sur la reconnaissance de ses droits, le respect, la coopération et le partenariat, et à veiller à ce que les communautés autochtones reçoivent les soins et le soutien dont elles ont besoin quand, on, quand elles en ont besoin. As we look ahead with cautious optimism, I want to ensure everyone that our priority remains supporting Indigenous leaders as they work to protect the health, safety and prosperity of communities. Miigwech. Merci Cho, Nakumik, thank you. Merci à tous. Merci Marc. Euh, en effet, des bonnes nouvelles. Des bonnes nouvelles parce qu'on sait que le secteur touristique est vraiment durement frappé par la, la pandémie, en particulier le secteur du tourisme autochtone. Et euh, c'est pour ça qu'on a pris plusieurs mesures pour aider les entreprises, euh, particulièrement les entreprises autochtones, à garder leurs employés, à gérer leur liquidité et en même temps faire face à d'autres coûts fixes. And the, Canada's tourism sector has been hard hit by the pandemic and the economic crisis. Just before uh, this, the beginning of the pandemic, we were looking at, again, record-breaking years, uh, another record-breaking year, and uh, the sector was growing by 3.5% per year. Uh, and of the tourism sector, the sector that was even most uh, growing the most was actually Indigenous tourism. And so the reality is also that many of these indigenous tourism uh, business are new and therefore more vulnerable. And that's why I wanted to commend my colleague for this new funding of $60 million. Uh, This has been uh, an ask on the part of the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada and his president, uh, Keith Henry, and I'm convinced they will be uh, uh, delighted because uh, definitely uh, 
help needs to be there for these businesses, and we need to make sure that we're able to help them survive this uh, pandemic, this economic crisis, and meet them on the other side of the bridge when uh, this is uh, over. So let's now take questions. Yes, Madame la Ministre, ce qui commence la conférence de presse, I would just remind you that we stick to one question, one follow-up, and we'll start to the phone, please. Operator. Merci. Thank you. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. Veuillez, s'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. The first question is from Lee Bergeon from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, this question is for Dr. Tam. Uh, many people are calling for an end to the blood ban a donation ban on men who have sex with men and trans women. What is the scientific reason for this ban still existing, and why is Canada still banning this practice when many other countries have lifted their bans? Yes, thank you for the question. I think um, you know, there, there needs to be an ongoing examination of um, science as well as uh, policy on this front. And um, absolutely, we need to continue to look at this policy. Thank you. Paula? And um, with, hind with hindsight, do you regret telling people not to wear masks initially? And was that advice really grounded in public health expertise or in fears that there would not be enough masks for the frontline people if people ran out to buy them? I think um, with a novel coronavirus, we're always learning more and more about the virus itself. I think since the beginning, uh, we've always um, asked people to, to cover the coughs or put a mask over someone who is sick. Um, and around... Um, As, as the science evolved, it became more evident that pre-symptomatic people who uh, haven't yet developed symptoms but is about to and asymptomatic uh, people can transmit this virus. So with the evolving science, the recommendation evolved. And so together with the other chief medical officers of health, we re-examined the science at the time and uh, recommended the use of um, non-medical masks or facial coverings uh, for the general public um, in uh, settings where you can't keep the two-metre uh, physical distancing. We were very careful to uh, remind uh, Canadians that this is just one additional layer of protection and it does not substitute for the core fundamental public health measures, including the physical distancing, uh, staying home with your sick, hand-washing, Um, and all the other measures, and that you have to check in with the local public health in terms of what the transmission of the virus is like in your community. So, um, so listen to your local public health from the perspective of uh, what you need to do. Um, but um, science continues to evolve, and um, we will continue to examine um, the recommendations on uh, non-medical mass use of facial covering Um, I'm sure we may not see the end of our recommendations and we need to keep an open mind on this. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Neu, I would just add to, the, to what Dr. Tam has said is that, you know, Canada is not alone. Certainly, uh, as the science has evolved, uh, it's countries around the world uh, exchanging uh, their experiencing and what's happened. And so certainly uh, uh, the sort of the uh, evolution in terms of the recommendation, in terms of the use of facial coverings has not been sort of unique to Canada. Look uh, what's happening in the United States and Europe and, and, and other countries. Uh, so certainly, uh, uh, Dr. Tam, in terms of uh, uh, what she said, it's been uh, consistent with uh, how the science has evolved and also uh, what's been happening uh, throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you, doctors. Uh, we'll go for one last question on the phone. Thank you. The next question is from Sharon Kirky from National Post. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Dr. Tam, sort of following up on the face masks, uh, the World Health Organization said this week that its infection prevention control network is discussing face shields. And a University of Iowa team recently reported uh, sort of the benefits of face shields over face masks, and they're urging sort of their adoption. I'm wondering your thoughts about the benefits of face shields or even goggles with masks for the public to help curb COVID-19 spread? I mean, should we be concerned about our eyes? Yes, so um, there, there's different uh, concepts of protection that we're talking about. So when we're recommending the uh, wearing of non-medical masks or face coverings, um, generally is to prevent 
the transmission of infection from yourself to others. So it's protecting others from yourself. So we're protecting each other. If you're looking at uh, vulnerable populations in particular and you're trying to protect the individual, uh, then it is important to cover your eyes because that's one um, area of your body where uh, the virus, if you happen to, well, if they ha you happen to encounter the respiratory droplet um, right next to you and it lands in your eye, that is a potential uh, risk. So wearing uh, goggles or face shield uh, can sort of increase the layer of protection uh, for the protection of the individual. So I think it is um, something that can, you know, can be considered for vulnerable populations in particular. So there are two different concepts for the general public going about uh, regular activities, stay home, you're sick. But if you're going out, wearing the non-medical mask uh, is one layer of added protection and in crowded places like public transit, etc. cetera. But um, that's, that's a, a very good question. And um, if we want to protect, for example, the elderly uh, themselves, uh, then uh, covering the eyes is an important concept. Thank you. Oh. And one follow-up, if I may. Um, uh, recently, some doctors in Italy said SARS-CoV-2 circulating in Italy appears weaker, that it appears to be losing potency. Now, that, that claim has been uh, criticized by others, but I'm wondering, what are we seeing here in Canada in terms of transmissibility and, and in terms of severity? Is there any sign that SARS-CoV-2 is, is, is changing, the, the SARS-CoV-2 circulating here? And could moving closer to the summer potentially lead to decreased virus activity? There are a lot of different concepts in your question. Uh, let me just try and unpack that. So from the perspective of the uh, genetics of the virus itself, um, the global uh, scientific community does not believe there are different strains that may uh, ch have changed the transmission or um, uh, virulence of the virus. Um, so that's one aspect of, of the data. But again, you know, you need to keep looking at that. It's not just the genetic evolution, but you actually have to have supporting uh, epidemiologic and clinical evidence about whether certain strains um, are related to uh, increased transmissibility or virulence or that there may be lab experiments, but there's no evidence from that front as yet. Um, in terms of uh, virulence, this virus is a serious public health issue. It continues to be extremely virulent, particularly for um, the different vulnerable populations, such as the elderly, people with underlying medical condition, and occasionally also causes very severe illness in younger age groups as well. So that hasn't changed in terms of its epidemiology but certainly we need to watch that carefully. Um, it is still a very serious public health issue. In terms of transmissibility, again, the, the virus, um, you know, evolution of the science is there, but no, absolutely, this virus is transmissible. It, it, that is how we need to look at it and need to go about our daily uh, public health measures uh, with the recognition that this virus is still a transmissible, a very transmissible illness, and continue our public health measures. It's Dr. New, just to add to what Dr. Tam has said uh, with respect to the, the question or issue about uh, in the summer months, whether we can anticipate uh, the virus, you know, increasing or, or decreasing in terms of a uh, uh, spread. Uh, there's two aspects to it. Uh, certainly, uh, from some of the evidence and experiences around the world, uh, we're seeing that uh, the virus is much more transmissible uh, in enclosed spaces. So actually going outdoors with the nice weather with our summer, that's a good thing. And uh, certainly, uh, we encourage people to go outdoors. Uh, on the other hand, though, unfortunately, is that uh, some people uh, going outdoors may then start to think uh, that they can relax all of the uh, uh, the good public health measures, the personal uh, measures they should be taking uh, with respect to physical distancing, etc. So it's a double-edged sword. Uh, certainly going outside would, in general, decrease your risk, but uh, you have to be uh, careful and uh, maintain all of those good public health measures, uh, the physical distancing, the hand hygiene, etc. Otherwise, uh, you'll just sort of negate the effect of being outside. Thank you. Thank you, doctors. We'll now go to the room. Molly.
Hi, doctors and ministers. Thanks for taking time. Molly Thomas, CTV National News. The prime minister this morning spoke very clearly that systemic racism exists in every institution, including the federal government. And so I'm wonder- wondering, Minister Jolie and Minister Miller, if you have any examples of what you've seen in this building, what you've seen in your offices, what you've seen in the party of systemic racism. Molly, look, that, that is an ex- excellent question, Molly. And, and you know, as, as, a, as a party that is, uh, has stated uh, and wants to be and has taken significant measures to be progressive, uh, we have our own mistakes uh, in, in the party. Um, luckily, we have um, pretty much a, uh, an inc- incredibly diverse group of people that have stood up and said they want to represent their fellow Canadians. Now, they don't only represent uh, their identity. They represent all the Canadians in their constituency. Um, I, for example, joined Black Caucus um, to represent uh, and to be able to speak more intelligently about the situation of the English Black community. My riding represents, uh, I represent Little Burgundy. Um, it, um, it has been an eye-opening experience. Um, and more often than not, my place is, is not to talk, but to listen. Some of the experiences that I tell hear from colleagues, uh, the, the experiences uh, I learned from uh, Selena, Cesar Chavan, um, from Greg Fergus, from Emmanuel, uh, they're, from Bardish, they, they, they are, they are, um, they've altered my way of thinking and, and had me re-examine a lot of um, views that I had. And, and I think Melanie would say the same. Um, they exist within the institutions. We've had instance, in, instances within the House where people have been judged based on the color of their skin. Um, we have a lot of work to do. And there is no institution in government that is immune by some magical stroke of fate from systemic racism. We are not saying that everyone uh, in society is racist. We have, uh, yes, unconscious bias, but systemic institutions that have been put in place and are creating outcomes that are unfair. You, you, you can't not... Uh, look at systemic racism uh, as uh, in, in the, you cannot look at the institutionalization of, uh, of incarceration, of uh, the overrepresentation of black and indigenous peoples uh, in, in the penal system and not have to reexamine s- systemic racism. Uh, you can't look at the underemployment of people of color in the civil service, provincial, federal, territorial, and not have to re-examine systemic bias. Uh, we've introduced measures to anonymize application process. You should never be in a position where you have to anonymize. But the reality was is people were uh, not being selected based on their name uh, looking a certain way. And it didn't read Mark Miller, I could tell you that much. Uh, so we have to keep fighting. And, and recognizing that is not a sign of weakness. I think it's a sign of maturity as a country. Uh, I think that we are at our best when we question ourselves, when we question... Um, when we when we question our, our our instincts, and I think that's something that needs to be done because I know we're turning around the the issue, but we, it needs to be examined in the RCMP, and there's no question about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Molly. That's a very good question. Um, I I I support what uh, Mark just said uh, regarding our colleagues learning from them. Uh, we've learned from our staff also, and in my former. Uh, work as a Canadian Heritage Minister. I was also in charge of multiculturalism. And uh, I had the chance to meet many communities all across the country. And, you know, even before the events that are happening uh, now, these discussions were happening. And many people were referencing to the fact that they had been discriminated or that they were going through... uh, different situations that made their uh, opportunities uh, harder to to seize than others. Uh, And that's exactly also why we decided to act and invest more. Uh, And even uh, in 2018, we came up with some new funding uh, to to support uh, some different uh, initiatives to counter racism. Um, Also, I, as a minister, obviously, I, I, I never went through myself systemic racism, but the first time I had to deal with the issue was when I had to defend uh, the, uh, uh, as, you know, anti-Islamophobia motion. And that was three years ago. Uh, and at the time, we had really tough conversations 
and it was tough also within the House because we never had unanimous consent on this very important motion. So I think that uh, this is a conversation that has been happening. I think, though, that, um, you know, what is happening right now is extremely important because I see that as the first um, uh, event following the public health crisis um, that we went through. And some say that the world has changed since uh, the pandemic. I think it, it is the case. And I think people want to have these conversations. And that's why we are willing to have these conversations, not only internally, but also with our colleagues and with Canadians. And we have to condemn systemic racism every time we see it. Thanks, Minister. My second question, Minister Miller, you mentioned the RCMP. Um, the head of the RCMP is still struggling to admit that systemic racism is a part of the force. The Prime Minister, though, said today he still has confidence in the head and Brenda Lucky to lead this country. Why should First Nations people, I mean, the people you represent, trust the system if the system of police doesn't even acknowledge the problem that disproportionately affects them? Well, I, I would just say that I... I as Minister of Indigenous Services, I, I am. Um, I would like to say that I serve Indigenous peoples. Um, I don't represent them, and I don't speak for them. Uh, we can't deny that there is systemic racism in, in all our institutions. Uh, and I'm, as I mentioned to you in in, in the early in the earlier response, uh, it isn't by some magical stroke of fate that the RCMP would be immune to that. Uh, we know it exists, uh, and we have to acknowledge it. Uh, I'm not going to judge the commissioner by a series of interview that she gave yesterday. Uh, she um, has said in the past, however, in fact, almost two years to this date, uh, when she spoke to the Murder and Missing, missing Indigenous Women's uh, Commission, that uh, as part of the apology of the RCMP, that she undertook to do better, uh, and that the RCMP and the Indigenous peoples were entitled to the best there was of the RCMP. Now, I look at the last, that was a promise, two years ago. Um, I look at the events of the last couple weeks. I look at an event that my colleague Mike McLeod from the Northwest Territories told me about an officer uh, who had a prior, um, prior conviction of sexual misconduct being put in Fort Good Hope. And I ask myself, is that the best? Is that the, is that the absolute best? Because that was the promise that was made two years ago. Um, we need to look at that. And we need to look no further than the report of, um, that came out from the Mis Murder Missing Indigenous uh, Women's Committee Commission. Um, it speaks loud and clear about the work that needs to be done. Uh, there's work to be done within communities to give them more police. Uh, we talk a lot about defunding, but perhaps this is a question about refunding. Uh, putting, t putting forward, as Minister Blair mentioned yesterday, a legislative framework uh, that allows Indigenous policing I look at a number of communities where, as a percentage of the population compared to non-Indigenous peoples, there is an over-representation of people that is served in the armed forces, that is served in the RCMP and various regional police forces, yet they don't themselves have their own policing community. That's not on the RCMP, that's on, that's on government. And it's something that we need to move forward on. Uh, and we need to look no further than that report uh, when we need to move on it. We have moved as interim measures. We continue to move on a number of the recommendations, but that's a very important one to move on to recognize because if you want to encourage nationhood self-determination, you allow people control and safety and security over their people. Uh, and, and, and the direct repercussion of that is uh, more women are safe. Um, and so those are my reflections. There's work to be done in the short term. In the short term, we ask, that we do not condone, and we need to punish bad behavior. We need to allow uh, independent investigations to be truly independent and to move forward. Uh, we need to move in the medium term on ensuring that there's proper policing. People are, are, are observing their oaths, respecting them. They took an oath, and um, many of them are very proud to, 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 to to exercise that function on a day-to-day -day basis serving Canadians and Indigenous peoples living in Canada. And on the long term, medium to long term, re-examining those institutions, constantly question um, the issues of systemic racism in, in institutions that hold exceptional powers of life and death. And with exceptional powers come exceptional responsibilities. Thank you. We'll now go to Ashley Burke from CBC. Um, Minister Miller, is it a problem that the commissioner of the RCMP doesn't seem to know the definition of systemic racism? And what does that say about the organization? 
as I said, I, I, I will not uh, judge the commissioner uh, on a series of interviews that, that she made. Uh, um, yesterday, I, uh, I'll judge her on the promises that she made to Indigenous peoples when it comes to my portfolio. Uh, we must acknowledge, the government has acknowledged that there is institutional racism in Canada. The RCMP is not immune, uh, nor is any organization. Uh, and that re-examination requires uh, a tremendous amount of education uh, and self-awareness, frankly. Um, we need to listen to those voices who have experienced it. Um, I can't speak for, for the commissioner, but um, I'm not someone that's experienced it. But I do listen. Uh, I, I, I question my instincts. Um, we all make mistakes. And this isn't a question about indicting every single person and saying they are racists or this is systematically within the institution, every person is a racist. That is misunderstanding it. Uh, Senator Sinclair says that systemic racism is when you take away the overt racism. It's, it's what's left over. It's the institutions that perpetuated it. Uh, it's the institutions that allowed it to thrive. And, and that's still there. We can't, we can't run away from that fact. And indeed, it's a sign of maturity to be able to say, yes, we're wrong. Um, but how do we take the measures to move forward? And when it comes to my portfolio, those recommendations are, 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 are squarely inscribed in the Murder and Missing Indigenous Women's Report. Um, I suspect there'll, there'll be a lot of conversations. Um, this will take tough leadership within the RCMP. Um, but I think indeed most, most officers will welcome it. Since the last press conference, there have been, and when you spoke out um, about, I guess, what you've seen in terms of the RCMP's actions, there have been other cases. How are you feeling now about what you've seen and, and what stands out to you that you're concerned about? Well, I, I'm concerned on a number of levels. Uh, the, the, there are, first and foremost, um, this isn't new. It's not new. Uh, we've seen a dangerous repeating pattern over the last three weeks. Um, I'm someone who believes in independent investigations. They truly need to be in, independent and they need to investigate the facts. The facts that I've seen are alarming. Uh, the facts that every Canadian has seen are very alarming. Um, and when we talk about um, punishing bad behavior, um, we're talking about, yes, the effects of systemic racism, but there's bad behavior and people took oaths. They need to respect them. Um, hard stop. And if they don't want to, there's a door and they can take it. Um, when we talk about systemic racism and the impact on, on communities, that's another discussion that needs to be had, yes, in the short term, but medium term uh, and long term discussions. We've had them at cabinet. Um, we need to be able to uh, allow an environment that um, doesn't reward bad behavior, doesn't turn a blind eye to bad behavior, indeed acknowledges and uh, turns up, points out unconscious bias. That means more representation within the forces. Um, when it comes to Indigenous communities on reserve, as I mentioned earlier, um, more police, um, policing in the proper way, re-examining what the police do, uh, their uh, various roles that they play. Uh, we talk about their roles within the context of wellness checks. Um, we talk about their, uh, people talk about the militarization of police forces. There are various aspects uh, that can't be fixed overnight, but we need to address them uh, quickly. Um, in terms of the Murder Missing Indigenous Women's Report, uh, legislative framework to, to, to circumscribe Indigenous policing. Um, it's one of the main important recommendations coming out of the inquiry. Uh, Minister Blair has undertaken to move on it. It's in my mandate letter as well as his. Um, these are lessons that we constantly need to reflect on and, and move on both in the, in the short term, medium term and long term. Um, we need to have some serious conversations with the government. Uh, you have national leaders, Luki Kutir, um, one of the Inuit leaders, uh, calling it out. Perry Bellegarde, national chief, has called it out. Um, I don't think it's necessarily going to be... Uh, the most positive conversation, but these are painful conversations that we have to have to have uh, as a country. I believe that it is a sign of maturity to be able to point out your flaws so that you can move on in a proper way. Um, the parallels that I've seen in Indigenous communities testify to the, the incredible allyship that the Indigenous communities have with the black community. Um, very few have been pointing out their own issues, and the, the, sim the, the parallels are strikingly similar, but they stand in solidarity with uh, anti against anti-black racism. 
Um, and that's a real test a testament to allyship. But we can't ignore in Canada that that exists within the Indigenous communities. And the outcomes that you see in the penal system, the outcomes you see uh, across society, are a result of systemic racism, and we can't hide from it. Thank you, Minister. We'll now go to Dylan Robertson from the Winnipeg Free Press, and then we'll go back to the phone for two last questions. Uh, hi, I have two questions for Dr. Tam about uh, COVID testing, not about antibodies. Uh, I'm curious how you feel about randomized testing. Uh, you know, as provinces open up, most are only testing suspected cases. Uh, is it a waste of resources to be testing a broader swath of people? It seems like some other countries are doing that. Yes, so um, again, together with the other chief medical officers of health, we discussed um, what is the um, testing uh, strategy going forwards now that we're sort of coming down the curve on the um, on the pandemic at the moment. So again, I think the um, priority is put on people with symptoms, any symptoms, even mild ones, uh, that is still the priority. Um, but expanding that so that there's more access to um, people in the in the, in the population um, so that we can jump on the cases, trace contacts and eliminate any sparks of uh, or chains of transmission. So then we uh, also discuss the testing of uh, people without symptoms. And the priority is still if you think you may have been exposed. So those who are contacts, uh, absolutely in uh, vulnerable settings like long-term care um, settings, correctional facilities, uh, crowded uh, congregate living or working conditions, uh, those settings where we've seen outbreaks, essentially. You have to have a very low threshold for testing, uh, both not just the uh, symptomatic, but if you detect even one case, to widen the net of testing to include the asymptomatic peoples. Some people are also unable to tell you if they have symptoms, for example. Um, and also, um, I think um, what we have also um uh, framed is the testing um, as part of uh, surveillance and pilot uh, testing in different populations. So I think what you're talking about may fit into that category um, where different jurisdictions are looking at testing in community settings. Uh, for example, particularly in hotspots, what you've experienced viral transmission is you've seen some of these mobile clinics being set up um, to offer testing to even people with a, without any symptoms. So that is to widen the net again to see if there's any hidden chains of transmission as well. And I think um, there's different strategies right now in testing um, not just vulnerable settings, but staff who work in them. So repeat testing for uh, those who work in long-term care, for example, um, and different vulnerable settings is part of some of the testing strategies what uh, we discussed amongst chief medical officers is the real need to share the data that comes out of some of those uh, testing approaches so that we can all learn from it and see if we need to uh, broaden the net in other um, areas as well. And uh, you kind of touched on this, but I'm wondering if you could expand a bit more, Doctor, on um, the testing specific groups. Uh, for example, we've had uh, truck drivers testing positive. Uh, I'm not aware of any sort of truck stop testing where we're just testing people in general or at the border. And uh, I'm curious if that's useful or a waste of resources. Um, I think some of these um, approaches are actually being actively discussed right now. So different jurisdictions are considering some of these and uh, you prob will probably hear about some of that in the in the coming weeks as well as you know as, as the as the cases come down attention is turning to well what methodologies could they have um, and maybe focusing on populations that may have uh, increased mixing with different populations uh, certainly focusing on um, looking at um, reducing any risk uh, from the importation of cases. And so um, for populations that are coming across the borders, etc., some, some of these are now uh, being uh, discussed. Uh, some of you may have heard about um, um, illnesses uh, that are appearing in the agricultural sector, for example. So um, there's active discussions and so how do we now maybe uh, provide that testing more widely 
uh, recognizing that some of the workers um, may not recognize symptoms, may be living in crowded conditions, may also be uh, worried about uh, disclosing their symptoms as well. So, so I think one of my key messages is that um, we just talked about racism, stigma and discrimination uh, has to be looked at very carefully. So if you were testing certain populations, be, be, be sure to ensure that you support different populations, support people who are, are testing positive. Otherwise, you won't get people coming in for testing. And that's important for um, um, essentially doing the work and detecting the cases. Um, so that might be some of the issues that we're dealing with as well now is uh, making sure that people recognize the importance of testing if you have even mild symptoms, uh, but also do not stigmatize people who test positive, but support them from uh, recovery and um, provide the right conditions for them to isolate and reduce transmission to others. Thank you, doctor. We'll now go to the phone for the last two questions. Thank you. Merci. The next question, not question question, is from Yasmin Mehdi from Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Bonjour, M. Miller. Dans, dans les derniers jours, on a vu des, des statuts de marchands d'esclaves déboulonnés au, au Royaume-Uni, en Belgique, aux États-Unis aussi. Ça a été le cas ici par le passé. Alors, est-ce qu'il y aurait lieu, selon vous, d'avoir une, une réflexion au Canada sur ces statuts et sur les noms de rues, par exemple, qui sont associés à des personnages historiques qui ont eu des liens avec l'esclavagisme ou avec la, la violence contre les Autochtones? Moi, j'encourage qui que ce soit qui écoute de, 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 de connaître notre histoire au Canada, qui est une belle histoire, pas nécessairement reluisante dans certaines conditions. Mon père a été euh, prof d'histoire à McGill pendant, pendant 45 ans. Euh, donc, euh, dans la mesure où je l'écoutais, euh, j'ai appris un peu sur notre histoire. Euh, mais McGill lui-même avait des esclaves. Euh, L'esclavage existait au Canada, euh, en Nouvelle-France. Il euh, ne faut pas le nier, c'est indéniable. Euh, L'enjeu des, 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 euh, des monuments, c'est une discussion, une discussion intéressante. Euh, Je n'ai pas encore formé d'opinion là-dessus, si on devrait déboulonner. Je pense qu'on devrait plus attirer l'attention euh, sur ces statues, voir ce que ces statues représentent. Dans la plupart des cas, quand, quand on, on regarde les statues au centre-ville de Montréal, ce pas des statues qui ont été érigées quand les personnes sont venues. C'est des statues qui ont été érigées des centaines d'années après pour, pour créer la notion de nation, pour une, pour une certaine fierté, puis un certain mythe là-dedans. Donc, dans toute question de réexaminer nos mythes, réexaminer l'histoire du Canada... Euh, voir la perspective des Autochtones qui se présentent devant, euh, devant une statue puis voient euh, une personne décrite comme étant autochtone euh, qui, se fait mar... <rire> qui, se fait, euh, qui se fait tirer dessus. Là. Ça existe à, à, à Montréal, ça existe, euh, ça existe partout. Donc, euh, moi, j'encourage à qui que ce soit de connaître l'histoire du Canada, surtout... Euh, Durant, le mois, durant ce mois-ci, qui est le mois de l'histoire des Autochtones. Il y a des livres à lire. Euh, C'est des livres qui vont vous ouvrir le, les yeux. Alors, euh, je ne prendrai pas position sur euh, pro-boulon, contre les boulons, et puis, etc. Euh, mais j'invite les gens à examiner ce que ces statues représentent, puis de se questionner. C'est important comme, comme nation de le faire. Euh, puis comme je l'ai dit en anglais, c'est une question de maturité, de questionner... Euh, de se questionner puis de, de s'auto-questionner. Désolé pour la, la réponse euh, euh, philosophie de, 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 de fin de semaine, mais c'est ma réponse. Merci. Uh, look, I, I think I, I, I believe in, in yeah, the, the, um, the reporter asked me a question about what we're doing with statues. And uh, I represent Montreal, which is one of the oldest parts of Canada, um, in terms of people that came here, obviously. Uh, it has a number of statues. Um, the Johnny McDonald statue is often covered in various shades of paint. Um, it's one of the 
founding prime ministers of Canada. I'm thinking about it. My, my dad was a, pro, a history prophet at McGill for 45 years. McGill himself was slave owner. Slavery existed in Canada. It existed in New France. We can't deny it. Um, we can't escape from it. I look at the different statues that exist in my writing, and uh, they weren't put up when people arrived, but they glorified people that arrived in a certain way. And a certain people glorified those people as a part of nation building that uh, left people behind, and notably indigenous peoples. Uh, when you, you know, a lot of issues have been raised with respect to plaques around Montreal that uh, glorify the shooting of uh, of um, Iroquois chiefs. It's, you can imagine how that would offend people. Um, there are statues that depict it. Um, do I believe in ripping them down? I believe in educating, and I believe in examining our history, criticizing it, um, re-examining it. I think the the highest compliment my dad ever paid for me, he's a very reserved person, was... Um, I wish I could go back and teach Canadian history the way the way I'm learning it now. And he taught it for 45 years. And uh, for someone to say it's something like that, you know, no one knows my dad, but um, for someone to say that is 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 sobering because we always have to re-examining re-examine our history, uh, educate ourselves. Um, if if we're blind to the past, we're we're blind to the future. Thank you, Minister. On va retourner au téléphone pour le suivi. Hey. Oui, et, et ma, ma deuxième question serait pour Madame Jolie par rapport aux 14 milliards de dollars qui ont été annoncés pour aider les provinces. Euh, le premier ministre a répété aujourd'hui que ce ne serait pas un chèque en blanc. Pourquoi est-ce que votre gouvernement insiste sur les transferts ciblés? Pourquoi ne pas simplement donner l'argent aux provinces et les laisser gérer elles-mêmes ces sommes comme elles le souhaitent? L'objectif du gouvernement présentement, c'est... Euh d'aider les provinces et territoires et les municipalités à pouvoir repartir l'économie. Et donc, euh, dans, une, euh, dans un souci de collaboration, alors que le premier ministre parle euh, chaque semaine maintenant avec les premiers ministres des provinces et territoires, mais on a voulu euh, trouver une façon de faire une offre euh, qui était sérieuse, mais aussi basée sur des conditions de réouverture de l'économie, euh, que ce soit euh, l'accès à de l'équipement euh, de protection individuelle, que ce soit pour euh, qu'il y ait des, assez de tests, que ce soit aussi euh, pour euh, soutenir euh, l'appui à la, euh, aux garderies, bon, euh, la garde d'enfants, on sait qu'au Québec, c'est pas la même chose que dans le reste du pays, ou encore euh, pour soutenir nos municipalités, il y a plusieurs besoins que les provinces et territoires ont, et donc euh, dans un contexte de les aider à, à réouvrir l'économie et, et, et à pouvoir soutenir les emplois et créer des emplois, on a mis cette offre sur la table, et je pense que les, continu- les négociations se poursuivent, et, et je pense que c'est au bénéfice de tout le monde au pays. Merci, Madame la ministre. On va aller au téléphone pour la dernière question. Merci, thank you. The next question, la prochaine question est de Julie Marceau de Radio-Canada. À vous la parole. Oui, bonjour. Euh, merci de me donner ce temps-là. Monsieur Miller, et peut-être Madame Jolie, euh, les deux, si c'est possible. Monsieur Miller, vous avez eu des, pro- des, des, des mots assez forts aujourd'hui pour dire, pour euh, vous nommer, vous verbaliser la présence de racisme systémique au sein des institutions fédérales, provinciales, territoriales, euh, municipales, civiles. Vous avez parlé même que c'est aux provinces, aux territoires à revoir leur pratique coloniale. Si c'est important de le nommer Qu'est-ce que vous dites aux provinces qui ne le font pas actuellement? Écoutez, le, le, merci Julie pour la question. La, la... Moi, j'ai un problème à, à constamment me mettre sa place publique puis de dénoncer qui que ce soit. Puis ça, 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 des fois, ça, ça sert à quelque chose. Des fois, ça sert à très peu. Des fois, ça fait l'inverse. Euh, les personnes dans les institutions euh, bureaucratiques provinciales, euh, évidemment, ont un examen à faire en ce qui a trait à l'existence du racisme systémique. Comme je l'ai dit, la définition du Senator Sinclair est, est, est apte. Le racisme, euh, la discrimination systémique, ça existe quand on enlève le racisme ouvert. Euh, c'est le racisme de coulisses euh, qui, 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 qui est institutionnalisé dans les systèmes euh, et dans ce cas-ci, dans les systèmes de bureaucratie qui existent dans les provinces et les territoires. Euh, on, on en parle 
constamment. Euh, on, on le voit euh, dans la sous-représentation euh, des communautés ethniques, euh, par exemple, dans plusieurs institutions euh, de ma propre province. Euh, nulle question de le nier, euh, mais le réexamen, ce n'est pas une question de pointer qui que ce soit du doigt puis les accuser, leur dire « j'accuse ». C'est plutôt euh, de, de, de sensibiliser. Euh, il y a un gros travail d'éducation dans tout ceci. Et je pense que ce qui désole les gens qui veulent du changement du jour au lendemain, c'est que l'éducation, ça prend du temps. La sensibilisation, ça prend du temps. Et évidemment, les gens sont sensibles euh, parce qu'ils se sentent visés. Euh, mais ce qu'on a pu voir à travers toutes les démonstrations, à travers notamment le Québec, parce que c'est la province que je connais le mieux, euh, c'est que les jeunes euh, sont en chef de file à, à nous sensibiliser au phénomène, à, à nous faire questionner, même, même, même les gens qui se pensent... Euh, à, à, à l'avant-plan de, 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 de leur propre connaissance sur la, le racisme euh, systémique. Les jeunes nous le font, euh, nous le font savoir et, et euh, ma réflexion, c'est que tôt ou tard, ça va se savoir, c'est une question de temps. Et donc, continuant le débat, euh, on est quand même une, une, une société démocratique, pluraliste, dont on a tous le, le devoir, le droit de s'exprimer, exprimons-nous. Euh, et on se choque d'idées et avançons ensemble comme, comme société. Merci, M. Euh, le ministre. Un, un dernier suivi. Euh, je peux juste dire quelque chose. Si c'est possible. Euh, dimanche passé, euh, j'étais à la marche à Montréal avec, euh, avec euh, des collègues, notamment Emmanuel Dubourg. Euh, je pense que le fait d'être présent envoie en soi un message qu'on on est à l'écoute, puis que la question du racisme partout à travers le pays, elle est, euh, elle est discutée, elle est, euh, elle est non seulement discutée, mais elle est dans les priorités euh, qui sont discutées dans nos cuisines, puis dans nos, euh, euh, au sein de nos familles. Euh, et puis c'est un, un mouvement qui a lieu, puis on doit en prendre acte, et c'est important euh, que non seulement on en prenne acte, mais qu'on agisse. Euh, maintenant, je vais prendre mon chapeau de ministre du Développement économique. Euh, je suis très consciente que, comme ministre en charge de maintenir des emplois dans une économie difficile ou aussi en créer, euh, ben, tout passe par le fait que euh, les personnes issues de différentes communautés puissent avoir accès à des opportunités et que c'est au cœur même euh, de, de, des choix qui s'offrent à eux et à leurs enfants. Et euh, c'est certainement une... une une des priorités au cœur de mon mandat, alors que je suis en charge du développement économique, développement économique régional. Puis, ce qu'on voit présentement, c'est que l'économie, la, la, la crise, elle frappe, oui, dans différentes régions du pays, très certainement dans l'Ouest, mais elle frappe particulièrement dans les villes. Et elle frappe particulièrement à Montréal et à Toronto. Montréal étant l'épicentre de la, la pandémie. Alors, euh, on répond présent, parce que présentement, ce sont des entrepreneurs qui sont parfois issus de différentes communautés, qui, euh, qui ont des restaurants, qui ont des petits, des petits commerces qui sont sur les artères commerciales et qui, euh, et toute leur vie, euh, dépendent de la survie de leur commerce. Et donc, c'est un travail qu'on fait à tous les jours, euh, d'essayer de, de, de les aider à survivre. Et puis, euh, et puis, justement, on sait très bien que l'accès au financement, l'accès aux banques, est parfois plus difficile pour des membres de différentes communautés. Et donc, nous, on est là pour euh, essayer, à notre façon, d'arranger le système pour qu'il y ait plus d'opportunités et qu'au final, le, la, les questions de racisme et d'absence d'opportunités liées au racisme soient contrées par le fait que nous, on arrive avec des mesures. Merci, Madame la ministre. On retourne notre téléphone pour le dernier suivi. Oui, M. Miller, juste pour compréhension, quand vous, euh, quand vous dites qu'on doit revoir les politiques, on est dans une fédération, comment est-ce que vous pensez pouvoir travailler ces politiques, ces lois-là, si on ne s'entend pas sur le mot « racisme systémique », que vous, vous le nommez, que, par exemple, Québec ne le nomme pas. J'essaie juste de voir comment est-ce qu'on peut revoir tout ça de façon cohérente si vous n'êtes pas sur la même page que Québec, par exemple. Julie, vous me posez plein de questions, déguisées en, en une. <rire> euh, la définition est importante. Euh, J'en ai esquissé une tantôt. Euh, c'est peut-être pas celle qui prime. L'important, c'est 
constater l'effet. L'effet que ça a sur les communautés autochtones euh, et noires notamment, mais aussi sur les diverses communautés ethniques qui en, qui en souffrent euh, de façon quotidienne, que ce soit dans l'embauche, la sous-représentation, les préjugés, euh, des choses qui, que, que eux souffrent, que moi je ne souffre pas. Les conséquences euh, sur la santé mentale, sur la condition socio-économique de ces gens-là est très importante. Donc, important de noter ce constat. Je pense que Québec l'a noté. Donc, vous avez parlé de Québec. Euh, ils veulent l'ébauche d'une un, euh, piste de solution. Euh, il faut se fier à la communication euh, dans toute fédération. Ça implique la coopération euh, et, et pas nécessairement euh, les, les, les diverses interpellations que l'on fait parfois. Euh, la ligne, la, le fil conducteur, souvent, c'est de s'assurer qu'on puisse avoir, euh, pas nécessairement sa place publique, mais entre en, en, gens qui sont élus, parfois par les mêmes citoyens, euh, cette discussion, et on en a le devoir, en fait. Donc, euh, on continue, on continue à avoir le dialogue, et euh, quand il y a un choc d'idées, euh, comme, euh, comme tout adulte responsable, euh, on s'en parle, et puis, euh, espérons qu'on avance. Euh, je suis très optimiste. Euh, la révision des, 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 des politiques est un travail, euh, travail très, très, très difficile, euh, ça prend euh, une coopération, surtout avec les gens qui sont touchés, donc les intervenants dans, dans la société civile, euh, dans mon dossier, euh, surtout la coopération avec les peuples autochtones. Euh, et et c'est un respect qu'on leur doit. Et euh, les résultats sont toujours euh, positifs, euh, je pense, plus récemment, à l'importance du dialogue dans, dans, euh, dans les barricades qui ont, pour tout fait, toute fin de pratique, euh, fermé le pays, le fermé, euh, fermé l'économie. Et euh, c'est qu'en faisant un dialogue ouvert, mature, qu'on a pu aller de l'avant. Euh, et c'est une différence euh, qui n'aurait pas nécessairement été le cas il y a 30 ans. Et je pense qu'on devrait tous en, temps fier, en, en être fiers. Merci. Merci, M. le ministre. C'est ce qui met fin à la conférence de presse aujourd'hui. Merci.